All right, everyone, I think we're going to get started. Thank you all so much for being here to learn about the biology of honeybees. We've got lots of people here in person with us, and I know some people joining by Zoom. So thank you. You're in the right place, and we're very glad that you're here. Uh, my name is Anna Withers, and I'm with Springfield Community Gardens. In case you don't know about us, we have 17 gardens, three urban farms. We have a community food forest. We also have a commercial test kitchen, all in Springfield, and it's all to support a community where everyone has access to healthy local food. So that's why we grow a lot of our own food and we donate it back to the community. We sell it to different markets. Uh, we grow growers. So we provide opportunities for people like you to come learn and connect with other growers around you so we can have a good, healthy no network of people who are passionate about feeding themselves the best, most nutritious food, as well as sharing with their neighbors. Uh, we provide an internship for people looking to learn more about farming. There's someone over here who took our internship earlier. Um, <laughs> and <clears throat> it's so important for all of you to be here and to be interested in this topic. Uh, just by a quick show of hands, who here has peeked at the latest agricultural census results? Anyone? Anyone? They just released the 2022 Agricultural Census, and um, Missouri is still the second, the farm with the second most amount of farms next to Texas, but we've lot, we had 95,000 farms uh, in 2017, and just like everywhere else in the nation, our farms are on the decline. Now we are at 87,000 and change, um, so we all eat food every day, hopefully multiple times a day if we're lucky, and none of us are eating food if the bees aren't eating food. So thank you for being here and being interested in helping our pollinators and helping your neighbors and just learning more. And if you do want to get involved with Springfield Community Gardens or anything that we do, we're very active on Facebook and Instagram. We have a website, um, springfieldcommunitygardens.org, and I also have some cards and flyers up here. So please check us out and reach out if you you know if we can help your growing journey in any way and since we are live and virtual tonight uh, just some quick housekeeping before we get started for those of you joining from home please help us keep track of our comments and questions separately so use the q a feature for questions and then if you have a general comment please feel free to leave that. But that helps us make sure we're answering all the comments or the questions as we get through the night. Um, and feel free to ask them as we go along. Bruce loves interaction and questions from the audience because, you know, we're here to serve you and to make sure we are covering our bases and giving you the information that you're seeking. So please feel free to ask questions, raise your hand as we go along. I think right. that's it from me. Yes, thank you, Anna, and thank you for your support and collaboration. Convoy of Hope's been blessed to collaborate with Springfield Community Gardens for the past couple of years since we've launched, and um, they do amazing work for our community, and just a thank you to you and your team. So, and we'll be doing more, more and more. All right, so um, just a little bit. My name is Faith Reese. First of all, I'm the Center for Agriculture and Food Security's uh, Project Manager, and um, our property for the agriculture department, if you're wondering, it wasn't in front of the building, we're behind the building, um, about 20 acres. Um, and we have several um, components there, such as high tunnels, and um, we'll have bees, or well, we have bees, and we'll have goats and chickens, and we have gardens there that lean, lean into global strategy um, demonstration for agriculture. Um, it helps with um, teaching that first generation farmer how to raise up and that's kind of our main focus. We have many other components at Convoy of Hope if you're not familiar. We have um, disaster services teams here, we have rural initiatives, we have um, community events and our global programs teams have women's empowerment in it. We have um, children's feeding initiatives around the globe and then we also have of course agriculture. So we're blessed to um, have our Center for Agriculture and Food Security 
um, for the past two years on this property. And Dr. Struble's in the room. He is the leader of our team. Um, I also want to highlight John Van Loan is here. He is our farm operator. And we've got Jaden with us. She is also one of the main workers on our property and keeps the team going. Um, so we want to invite Mr. Bruce Snavely up. He is um, a major facilitator on our property in that he helps uh, maintain and support the bees on property. We have seven hives. Um, and Bruce, come on up. I don't like to stand up here alone, so join me. Um, Bruce has been avid, an avid beekeeper for 17 years. I believe you learned that from your father a little bit. Is that a little bit? Yeah. And um, the Beekeeping Association of the Ozarks, you were the president of and vice president, yeah, for 10 years. Very active in all, there's a microphone, in all of the community support here locally to educate and to drive that, and he still continues to do so. So Bruce, I'm going to hand the mic to you. And thank you for being here and for all that you do for our, our community and for Convoy. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Faith. I appreciate uh, working with, with Faith and Dr. Struble. Uh, it's been a joy to uh, just have bees on property and see what goes on with Convoy. And I've always wanted to uh, be a volunteer in some way with convoy and this uh, certainly has opened up a door and allows me to do that and thank you for coming uh, i have been a beekeeper for 17 years uh, my dad passed these uh, hives to me uh, before his uh, death and i am so thankful for that it's it's been an interesting uh, ride as a beekeeper everyone is different and takes beekeeping in a, in perhaps a different perspective uh, but uh, i've been in church ministry for uh, 11 years full time and i did not think that bees could have any connection whatsoever with that world and um, until I was invited by a missionary friend to uh, go to India, Nagaland. And so I went there in the foothills of the Himalayas, a uh, beautiful, beautiful country, and met with about 20 uh, people from, from Nagaland who are beekeepers and had the most uh, extraordinary time I've seen uh, Apis serrani uh, bee, the Asian bee, which is much smaller than the, than our bee, honey bee in the United States. Uh, and then I was invited to go to Guatemala a few years later and uh, teach beekeeping in a children's home uh, to the staff there. And both of those projects uh, one was in 2013, so that's been 11 years ago in, in Nagaland, and that project is still going where we formed a honey co-op with uh, farmers there to be able to sell their honey because uh, the average income per household at that time was $500 a year, pure household, and uh, so we were able to sell it in a in a more wealthier, uh, the Kohima capital of Nagaland and form a co-op. And that is still going after 11 years. That That's kind of my pride uh, and joy in uh, hearing that report. And and that that uh, actually uh, supports the, the uh, uh, a, a teacher in a school there in a slum area. And uh, and it also uh, supports around uh, 12 to 15 kids each year. Just, just, and it also helps a, uh, I think I mentioned the church, a church in that slum area. So uh, just incredible things, you know, that that, that, that helped. And then I just got a, a, a text from 
the Children's Home Director in Guatemala this, this week and said, we just harvested 20 gallons of honey for our uh, children's homes. And they have uh, five different homes with uh, about 70, 75 kids in, uh, in that location. So um, awesome things can happen in, uh, in beekeeping. Okay, thank you for coming. And uh, I, I look forward, I hope I can interact I'm with, with some of you. Um, I know some of you, uh, beekeeper friend here is, uh, is his name is Bruce, <laughs> is from uh, a beekeeping club in, in Nixa. And in the state of Missouri, there are um, over 50, 50 clubs that help support uh, beekeepers. And it's a great community, just like the garden community is. I was excited to hear Anna talk about that. Um, <clears throat> so, well, I'm, I am here to talk about uh, a few different things. And uh, biology, uh, we're going to, you know, tie that in with, with food and uh, the ecological significance of bees in our environment and how that it ties together with our environment, uh, the development of plants and bees tie in together, um, the significance of food to our, uh, uh, bees to our food security, and just the diversity of bees in the United States. So I'm, I'm talking not just about honeybees, but also I'm referring to native bees um, that, that are not really honeybees, but they all play in together with our uh, environment, with raising our food and just the plant life in general. Okay, so there's a lot of diversity of bees in the United States. I'll just, I'll throw s some factual information out, you know, throughout this presentation. And uh, for instance, you know, this, did you know there's 4,000 different species of native bees in the United States? 4,000. Uh, Ten percent of those uh, have not been identified yet or named, but uh, entomologists know that they're that they're out there. Uh, talk about the stressors of honeybees, uh, the biology of honeybees, anatomy, behavior. Uh, you know that's what drew me into beekeeping. Really, is when you get to studying the amazing biology. Of, of honeybees, and this is true of, of other bees also. I've just happened to study honeybees more. Uh, but any, any animal, uh, perhaps you, you know, have goats or cows, cats, dogs, hamsters, snakes, you know, whatever your, your, your pet is or, or animal that you take care of, the, the biology behind an, an animal or an insect in this, you know, is, is just amazing to me. And then we'll talk about the Apis mellifera uh, honeybee in the United States uh, as, as we end this. <clears throat> so on this, uh, on this diagram, I, I'm, I'm trying to show that, you know, it's, all, it's tied together here with uh, what takes place. If you look up at the top, you know, how many have said after a period of cold weather, yay for spring. It's, you know, I can go outside and smell the, the spring air and feel the warmth of the sun and, and uh, see things growing and the grass is getting green and, you know, the birds are more active and chirping and it all you know, life seems to just spring uh, <clears throat> up uh, at this time of year. And, <clears throat> and it's directly tied, you know, together to uh, plant life and bee life development. I hope you understand how significant bees are, you know, in this whole thing. So... <clears throat> Colony development, and I'm, I'm talking about honeybee colony development. 
uh, <clears throat> is tied directly to the progression of, of flowering plants, okay? And plants indirectly then is tied to the nutrition of the colony. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, spring pollen, how many know kind of when pollen starts around here? It might surprise you. When you start sneezing, what what month did you say? January. I've seen bees in my colonies uh, start bringing in pollen, pollen the week after Christmas. Okay, uh, so uh, pollen, uh, whether it's uh, 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 maples is a big one for early early uh, pollen, uh, some cedars. Um, you know, there's a lot of trees that benefit uh, beekeeping or bees in general that we don't think about. We think about the flowering flowers and things like that that we see around us on the ground or whatever, but trees are huge. Uh, for both pollen and early nectar. And so, uh, you know, the pollen has to take place for the bees to gather pollen. And what is pollen to bees? Pollen is protein. So in a, in a bee's diet, pollen is protein, Nectar is carbohydrates, and pollen is fed to the baby bees as they uh, begin to develop. Beehives consume a lot of pollen. You might not realize this, so while we as humans are complaining about pollen and allergies, which I'm affected by those also, Inside, I'm saying, yes, here it comes. Bees development and colony development is going to ramp up tremendously. Uh, did you know that a queen lays an egg? Maybe you didn't know that. Bee queens lay eggs. They're real tiny, looks like a grain of, of rice. They actually stand up vertically in the bottom of the cell when the queen lays an egg. And after three days, that egg slumps over. And it doesn't hatch in the sense of an outer shell like a, like a chicken egg. It's called eclosion, where the outer skin melts and a larvae is a result and lays there in a semicircular position and it lays down, okay? When that happens, that larvae starts to be able to uh, consume food that the nurse bees supply to that larvae. And from day three to through day eight, that larvae grows exponentially and is visited by nurse bees. Nurse bees are bees that are uh, over seven days old and they will feed those larvae 1300 times a, in a 24 hour period, depending on their nutritional needs. Now, how do I know that? Because scientists in the United States, you've got to realize there are like five or so laboratories, labs in the United States that the government operates just for bees. Okay, I've, I've toured one in, uh, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. It's called the Honeybee uh, Breeding and research laboratory where they have uh, um, helped new 
races of bees be developed in the United States for one thing, but they have like 12 scientists there working, you know, 24 seven year round, just studying bees and eight lab assistants, 22 ploys all total. We had new uh, uh, geneticist scientists there besides entomologist. Uh, there were mo molecular scientists there on staff. The, the, the molecular scientists, uh, you know, studied liquid in test tubes that had been frozen for f minus 400 degrees. Now, you know, that's, that's not my idea of beekeeping, but we need those, we need those people. And they do projects and, and reports and write out reports, you know, uh, and you can, re you can uh, look at those online if you like to read a, uh, you know, a 20 page scientific report on bees. <laughs> but uh, anyway, the United States is incredible in that. So, so the bees build up because of pollen and nectar. They need nectar in order to fly the carbohydrates. You and I think, you know, man, we're eating too many carbs. I don't know as a bee that you can eat too many carbs. So we're not worried about really bees consuming too many carbs, you know, like, like humans are. Uh, but they need, they need nectar to fly. They need nectar. Uh, they mix with the pollen and feed the babies what's called bee bread. And there's a fermentation process that goes on that takes place that breaks down this pollen uh, in order to consume. Uh, when bees are uh, emerge as baby bees out of the uh, pupa stage, uh, they consume, they need to consume a lot of pollen also uh, because there's a gland in their head called the hyperpharyngeal gland that produces uh, royal jelly that that also is fed to uh, the queen and the drones, the male bees and the worker bees in different, uh, different mixtures of, of, um, of royal jelly. So pollination takes place in plant life and you know what pollination is, right? You gardeners know you have to have pollination, you know, uh, where the male, male part of the flower uh, is is inserted into the female part of a flower. That's uh, you know uh, pollination. Fertilization takes place uh, as a result of pollination. And and uh, I don't know if I can go back, but uh, look at that bee there on the right. Uh, all that pollen that gathers on that bee uh, is, and she's got what's called a pollen basket. Uh, and a bee uh, actually has what's uh, a form of static electricity that you you know you get when when our our hair what maybe some of us don't have as much hair as we used to and it's turning gray or white or whatever but uh, but a bee will will f fly into a flower and the static electricity absorbs that pollen like it flies off the flower directly onto the bee's body. It just attracts it. And, and then she starts uh, amazingly, uh, she has a way of packing that on her hind legs uh, called the corbicula. And uh, it's, uh, I get carried away on biology, so I, I love, love that stuff. You know, that's, that's the sad part though I wanna point out. Look on the left, uh, dead bees on a flower, uh, you know, they have all kinds of stressors with, with chemicals being used uh, in the wrong way on flowers and different chemicals, you know, just can cause a toxic uh, uh, reaction to bees. So we need to be careful uh, when we're using chemicals on, uh, on flowers and, and our lawns. Uh, it's not just farmers that we uh, can talk about, but it's also us urban people that want to spray everything in our lawns, you know, and kill all the dandelions and weeds and that the bees actually need pollen from, like hen bit and dead nettle uh, this time of year, okay? Uh, 
So uh, pollination takes place. Trees warm. You know, days lengthen. Uh, that's all part of uh, plant life. Uh, bee food brings more bees. Plants uh, produce what? Uh, as a result of fertilization and pollinization, you know, uh, has to take place so the fruit has the right amount of seeds in it to be a healthy uh, fruit or vegetable uh, nut. So if, if bees didn't pollinate uh, cucumbers, for instance, you'd have a little dwarf looking cucumber uh, that would be just really scrawny. It wouldn't be filled out. Bees are, res you know, bees and pollination fertilization is a result of the growth of our vegetables and not only the growth of the vegetable itself, but the increase in, in crop production. And there's, there's studies that you can look at that shows what uh, so many hives per acre in a certain crop will increase the production of, of, uh, of different, different vegetables and flowers, whatever. Uh, in that, um, and there's a standard for beekeepers. Uh, they know what crops that they pollinate, and, and there's, I can talk about that uh, a little bit later, but uh, it's, a, it's a big, big deal for beekeepers to, to be involved in, uh, in pollination sometimes. I'm not involved in it uh, because I don't, I don't have enough hives to to do that, but we'll, I'll show you what's happening with that later. Um, so the colony development of honeybees is tied into the timing of the plant life development and also the development of the colony. Uh, so knowing basic biology of honeybees is the, is the beginning of understanding colony development. As, as, as a beekeeper and managing them. Uh, you know, we can look at a single bee and we can study, you know, that bee and know that that bee uh, can have certain issues uh, in its growth, but the whole colony as a whole is a super organism, a colony. So we can look at a colony and, and relate it to uh, an animal, the colony itself. Do you know that the Department of, uh, Department of Agriculture considers a beehive uh, livestock? Uh, so for instance, uh, in the personal property tax system in Missouri, uh, you know, you have to, you're supposed to account for how many head of livestock you have. You also have to uh, uh, establish in that same form with livestock, how many bee colonies you have. Uh, and like it or not, <laughs> you're, you're assessed a taxation rate on, on, uh, on what you own uh, and that includes beehives. I've always struggled with that because, you know, the 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 cycle of of colony life is, you know, when you fill out that that tax form, uh, uh, and you're supposed to turn it in, you know, by the end of December, uh, there can be there can be colony loss after that, you know, between December and March is one of the uh, times when we lose uh, a lot of beehives. So that's, that's part of that. But colony development, the peak production of foraging bees needs to correspond with the time of the nectar flow. And so as beekeepers, you know, we try to ensure that our bees are healthy, that they're, that they're fed, so you're taking care of bees and when beekeeping uh, like you would take care of, of livestock. If you look at it that way, you're, you're feeding, 
your bees when they're when they nutritionally need it. Uh, you know, because there's a dearth period there, not just in the summertime, but also, uh, you know, between October and and into January uh, and February, there's not much there for them uh, if they can't even go outside uh, to to bring back into their hive for food wise. So you're treating uh, bees uh, with that. Uh, Major nectar flow around here usually starts in uh, in March. This year is an unusual year where um, where the bee colony development and honeybees and and bees of all species uh, seem to be about three weeks ahead of schedule in in um, other years. And if you look at the uh, annual uh, temperature range. Uh, for this time of year, we're well ahead of the average temperature, daytime temperature. So, you know, plants are growing earlier. Uh, so bees are corresponding with that. Um, but <clears throat> you try to have large colonies because they're more productive colonies in beekeeping. You know, there's more forager bees to go out. Uh, there's there's more uh, resources in a hive uh, when it's when it's larger. There's more nurse bees. There's more food sources in uh, in a larger colony, and <clears throat> so <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> so the importance of bees to our food security, and I'm I'm just really happy to be part of helping convoy with bees uh, as it ties into this. And, you know, the fact that they're helping in uh, other countries develop uh, processes and uh, best practices in, in gardening and, and, and crop, crop management um, is exciting to be, uh, to see that. But here's some quotes uh, on, on this from the National Institute of Health. Bees contribute to the global food supply, Center for F Food Safety. Honey bees alone pollinate nearly 95 kinds of fruit. The UN Environmental Program uh, states, the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, a third of the world's food product depends on bees. USDA National uh, uh, of Food and Agriculture uh, says 75% of flowering plants and 35% of the world's food crops are dependent on pollinators. And, you know, there's not just honeybees, of course, there's, uh, in, there's other pollinators which include uh, bumble, bumblebees. Uh, I know there's, uh, there's at least 40 different varieties of bumblebees in, uh, in, in some areas, but 4,000 different native bees. Uh, so here's a, a look at the diversity of bees in the United States. So in the scientific classification family, uh, Apidae, there's seven families in the world, and six are in North America. And you recognize some of these. I haven't given the scientific name, but, but plaster bees, sweat bees, sand or digger bees, small soil nesting bees, leaf cutting resin mason bees, and then the lawn ton bees like bumblebees and honeybees. Uh, leaf cutting bees is a bee that's used in, uh, in alfalfa uh, and also just in general gardening. I have a friend who, uh, who works actually for the Boyce uh, Samaritan Ranch that uh, uh, his daughter ordered them a colony of leaf cutting bees that they're, they're keeping in their, in their garden. One thing, they don't sting. <laughs> they don't. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, the species of all bees, 18,000 in the world, approximately. 
There's 4,000 in America, North America, but the honeybee species in the United States was only one species of honeybees, and that's Apa mellifera in the United States. Uh, April, uh, Apis mellifera is not native to the United States, but it's naturalized in almost every country of the world except uh, northernmost cold countries, okay? Uh, there's actu there actually was a bee in the United States uh, before the European settlers. Uh, there's a fossil record from uh, the state of Nevada that they found that uh, corresponds with uh, a history of bees that scientists know about that's extinct. So, uh, but uh, the Apis mellifera bee was brought over um, with the uh, Europe, Europe uh, settlers. So there's different races of honeybees with Apis mellifera in North America. Uh, Italian bees, Carniolan, Caucasian, and <laughs> Apis mellifera scalata, or the uh, Africanized bee. And there's been a lot of horror stories on the Africanized bees. It's not allowed in, in most states that I'm aware of. The United States, you can go onto a map uh, and see when it entered the United States and, and what states that they've found found that colonies in. They're eradicated when they find these. It's a very aggressive, uh, defensive uh, honeybee. Uh, but in other countries uh, south of America, you know, they, they try to manage that bee because it's such a, a large honey producing colony. Um, but there's none that's ever been found in the state of Missouri, so you can, you can, uh, you know, go to bed tonight and just rest <laughs> on that, on that. Uh, differences of bees in the United States, and look at this between native bumble honey, uh, bumblebees, because I know bumblebees are native bee also, but, you know, they, they collect pollen and nectar also, the native bees, but it's just for their own colony, uh, to, to feed their young and uh, to raise them. Uh, but, you know, most of the native bees don't survive through the winter time, just the queen does. And then she uh, starts a colony the next year and then dies that second year after she's established a colony. You, a lot of times that's what happens. Uh, the native bees are, a lot of them are specialists. In other words, they only they only, some of them only go to a certain flower. One, one, one species of flower, some of the native bees do. They're not general special, general foragers like bumblebees and, and honeybees. Um, size of colony are small for native. Uh, I've read where bumblebees can get up to two to 400 in a colony. Um, I don't know that I would want to work in a hay field like I did in high school uh, and encounter a, a 400 hive of, of honeybees in a, in a bale of hay that I picked up, you know, in, in my high school years. Uh, many, uh, most native bees, a lot of them do not have stingers. Uh, Bumblebee and honeybees do, but it's it's the the females have stingers. Uh, the male bees uh, in a bee colony do not. Drones, uh, the queen does, but she doesn't very rarely sting humans. Uh, she stings other queens in queen cells, you know, to end their life. Uh, so, you know that some of you may say, what? Uh, so it's it's not you know a bee colony is is not a politically correct uh, you know set of insects. They're they they're 
uh, doggy dog or queenie queen. <laughs> and uh, they, they are controlling their own hive, protecting their hive, okay? Uh, human management doesn't take place with native bees. You can, you can get a bumblebee uh, colony. You can buy it and, and acquire a bumblebee colony, and some beekeepers will move bumblebee colonies to, to farms uh, where they want them. Okay, but they don't manage them in the sense that we beekeepers, you know, look in their hive and move their move the frames around inside a beehive and and do all this feeding and or whatever, you know. Um, so that doesn't take place. Um, <clears throat> so this is an interesting map. If you've never uh, known too much about pollination. Uh, did you know beekeepers move beehives by the thousands, by the hundreds of thousands across the United States? Um, so this is the middle of March. So the largest, the largest crop in the United States that bees pollinate is right out here in California. Look at the map. Uh, 1.6 million beehives pollinate almonds in February and March. I don't think they've all returned to their home states. Uh, usually they're taken out at the end of January and put in holding yards in the deserts uh, outside of the orchards in California, and then they're moved into these respective yards. But I know beekeepers in Springfield, Missouri, who have taken semi loads of bees out to California. Okay, I think you can get about 450 beehives on a semi, um, a one one box colony, and there's uh, pollination contracts of anywhere from 160 to 200 dollars per hive. Uh, so add the math on that, and there's beekeepers that take several semi-loads of bees out there all the way from, you see the line from Florida. Florida's a big beekeeping state, and they truck bees there. Uh, but literally every state, I think, in the United States, beekeepers will send bees to uh, California if, if they have enough and if they want to do that, okay. But then there's different crops then throughout throughout the uh, the United States that after the the pollination, uh, usually the bees after pollination are brought back. Like uh, I have friends that in Missouri that go down to uh, Oklahoma, where bees are brought from California and uh, help help uh, beekeepers. Uh, you know, they go through the hives, they split them. I mean, you're talking about thousands of colonies. You know, it takes a lot of labor to do this. And, uh, you know, to inspect all the colonies after they come back, they usually split them, and they can easily increase their size of their operation in time for these other crops in the United States by, you know, by at least doubling the size of their uh, of their uh colonies but you know they head out to uh new york the apples i've i've been to new york and seen the apple orchards my we have a son that lives out there uh blueberries cranberries in maine uh and in massachusetts uh which is a big big agriculture area um it just and the canola up north uh did you know uh what what state produces the most amount of honey in the United States? The Dakotas, believe it or not. Uh, the Dakotas, uh, yeah, huge. Uh, 2.3 million acres of pollinated acres in, uh, in North Dakota. Uh, canola fields, uh, it's, it's just a, it's it's incredible, and uh, a lot of beekeepers. I know a beekeeper in East Texas that also owns property in North Dakota, 
and he ships his bees up to up to North Dakota and has a separate honey honey uh, packing place and and extraction place and and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's amazing how many what they do with moving bees in the United States. And these are the commercial beekeepers. So you and I aren't commercial beekeepers. I'm not. I probably won't ever be. Uh, backyard beekeepers and you know hobby. Uh, small sideline beekeepers, I guess, is what I would consider myself. Uh, we far outnumber commercial beekeepers, but you know we need both in the United States because this is talking about crop production of huge crops, and uh, honeybees work excellent in in that respect as well. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> distribution of honeybees in the United States. And this this tells you here, uh, you know, some some numbers that are amazing, really. Uh, 2.6 million colonies in 2023, January 2023, uh, in the United States. And and uh, Anna referred to the a United States uh, Agriculture Report and. Part of the USDA agriculture reporting reports on honeybees like every quarter, so you know you can you can read that and and uh, see where the numbers are with colonies with with the amount of honey that's produced. All of that is in the USDA uh, annual you know agriculture reports. Uh, <clears throat> so. 2023, last year of April, 2.7 million colonies. Of course, the, the highest number of colonies is always going to be in the second quarter of, of the year, and then it, it trends down uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> you know, from there or summertime. Uh, so the lowest number would be uh, the first quarter and the, the last quarter. And then the second and third quarter would be the largest quarters uh, every year, number-wise of bee colonies. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I'm going to stop here for uh, any questions on what I've covered so far, because I want to. I want you to have opportunity. Yes, Anna. Okay. That's that's fine. That's fine. Uh, really, uh, what is the difference between a hive and a colony, or what distinguishes them? So, I'm using the word interchangeable. Really. Uh, the colony would more refer to the the bees themselves. Um, yeah, you you could have a colony without boxes if they were living in the wild or something like that. But yeah, what what basically I'm I'm referring to the same thing. It, it's one one set of bees with that has a home uh, box set up like this. Uh, usually one queen, but there are instances actually when there are two queens in the same colony that survive. It's usually a mother-daughter uh, queen setup. Uh, good question, though. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. No, I do not on the number of visits, but that would make sense. Uh, okay, so our question was, uh, for instance, how many trips does it take uh, for a plant to be adequately, adequately pollinated? And she mentioned apples being eight, eight trips. I haven't studied that enough to no specifically on that, but it sounds correct to me. Uh, bees make multiple trips 
in one day. And what's interesting is one colony basically, you know, sends out scout bees from that colony to find nectar sources. And they will find a source, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, but they come back to the hive and they communicate where that source is to the rest of the foraging bees in amazing ways, okay? Uh, there's dance communication. I, I, you know, I probably couldn't, but a scientist could stand up here and talk to you about the dance communication between bees for hours, okay? I've studied it. I've studied it for a few hours, but I couldn't probably talk about it for, for hours. But it's amazing. They communicate taste to the other bees. They communicate location where it's at. Um, and they do all this. Understand, you know, you have to understand this is inside of a dark colony, a dark box that they communicate all this. And we're going to talk about communication a little bit later. But, um, yeah, it's a good question. Anyone else? That's fine. No. No, uh, the question is, are they, are they nocturnal? And what's the other word? Not, yeah, no, they're, they're only daytime uh, bees. Uh, a honeybee is, is, uh, has this amazing compass directional direct, sense of direction with the sun itself. Now, they can still fly on, on cloudy days, which is also amazing. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm going to show you a little video at the end of this. But bees have this dance communication, you know, and scientists have studied the dance language of honeybees. And some of you may have this really puzzled look on your face about dance communication, but it is, it is just fascinating. Uh, so it's on a vertical, you know, vertical uh, <clears throat> a frame. If you've never seen a uh, a frame inside of a hive, okay. Uh, this is a this is a typical typical frame that bees uh, have all these uh, octong octangular uh, shaped cells. And bees construct all that, and it is that's amazing too that they can make that uh, that all those spaces just like that. Uh, and do you know that the bottom edge of the um, of each cell is tilted thirteen degrees upward? So when the bees pack nectar into it, it doesn't run out, or you know it's just. Uh, Okay. All right. So, uh, yeah, bees, the queen lays eggs in these, and this is also used for packing honey into, um, and uh, they can put enough honey in here where one, one frame could weigh 10 pounds. I've actually weighed one that was close to 10 pounds after honey, and uh, there's, 10, there's nine to 10 frames of these in one box. And with the weight of the box, uh, I weighed one one time that was 92 pounds. So, you know, uh, you probably can't lift those all day long. And there's smaller boxes and smaller frames that beekeepers also use. Uh, but um, anyway, any other questions? Yes, Nate. Well, these, these would have, this, this is a 10 frame box, and they also make eight frame boxes that are smaller. Well, that's, that's, so this size box with these size frames, okay, which is, which is called a deep 
frame. Uh, this this actually has honey in it, some capped honey, and uh, some just open open honey on that side. Uh, but a box full of this size uh, could fill a five gallon bucket, close close to five gallons, which is sixty pounds of honey. In in a yeah. That's a 10 frames. I, I'm just guessing an eight frame would produce 45 something or so, I don't know, or or 50, something in that neighborhood. Uh, yes, yes, uh-huh, yeah. And this is, a, you know, this is a medium sized frame and uh, so, this this hive setup here is actually, uh, you know, you can see this is this is a medium medium box they call it, and uh, so this full of honey uh, could be thirty pounds, thirty to thirty five pounds of honey after it's extracted. Well, I, I will say that there that I know beekeepers who extract honey and fill up 55 gallon drums and will load up a a semi trailer with solid 55 gallon drums of, of honey. I, I don't produce enough honey, you know, <laughs> you know, to fill up one 55 gallon drum. I hope to some someday maybe, but. That's a good question. I mean, uh, uh, so typically, uh, full full colony uh, needs uh, needs a box, a full box of honey. But I will say this: that beekeepers feed sugar syrup uh, to their bees, and and you know, so I know you think, well, that's not the same as that's not the same as honey, sugar syrup. Well, no, it's not for us. You know, it's much healthier for us to consume honey than than sugar, sugar syrup or sugar. Period. Uh, that's 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 another uh, probably talk. But uh, but bees, they they thrive on it. So that's one thing to know about the nectar and flowers. The nectar and flowers uh, and plants is uh, can, can be up to 70% uh, water uh, and, and it's, all, it's all sucrose, okay? Uh, so <clears throat> bees need sucrose because that's what they're gathering from flowers anyway. Uh, and honey, you know, uh, is not sucrose. Now, just think about that for a minute. And I'm getting off on a little tangent maybe, but how, how does nectar go from flowers and plants to being sucrose to the international standard for honey says, honey cannot have more than 5% sucrose. The actual, the actual normal standard is three point something sucrose. And then you have glucose and fructose. Okay, and so bees are the great chemist of the world, I'm telling you, because they use enzymes that their glands, uh, uh, you know, endocrine glands in, inside, endocrine is ex, those ex, exodocrine, outside glands, but with internal glands, they produce nectar. They produce enzymes that convert uh, nectar to honey. Okay, so the bees are the ones making honey. Beekeepers don't make honey. All we do is extract the honey. 
So bees convert with uh, 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 al almase, um, invertase. These are enzymes that their glandular system produces. And uh, so invertase inverts, as the name applies. And you know what one form of, of invertase uh, produces? Hydrogen peroxide. So you've heard that honey is highly, you know, <clears throat> antibacterial. And, and that's why, because bees convert and uh, bacteria cannot live in honey because of, of um, you know, of, of, of their converting and having some, some of that uh, hydrogen peroxide in, in honey. Now it's, you know, we're not drinking hydrogen peroxide but it has enough in it that bacteria cannot live in. And so, you know, honey is just wonderful product, not just, uh, you know, to consume as food. And honeybees produce the only, in, the only food produced by insects is the honeybee, okay? Uh, <clears throat> unless, unless you're, you know, into eating fried, fried bugs or something, <laughs> but, but no honey. And so, uh, <clears throat> for instance, my, my wife had, had a, a sore that she had looked at by the doctor and it was, uh, you know, eating a hole in her leg. And uh, so after cutting that out, uh, what did the doctor prescribe? He wrote her out a prescription for medicinal honey here at Mercy Hospital, okay? And she went to the pharmacy and they gave her medicinal honey, which is uh, the highest antibacterial honey in the world is Manuka honey. Uh, I know it's produced in New Zealand, uh, but uh, anyway, this is this is hospital grade. Also, it's sanitized without without removing the antibacterial properties of the honey. But uh, I know a doctor at at, uh, at CMH and Bolivar that used it in uh, can for cancer patients uh, in their hospital for bed sores because. Uh, the doctor said, well, you can, if you don't use this, you'll have to change your bandage uh, twice a day, which was very painful uh, for my wife. Or you can use this honey as a salve, you know, in the bandage and uh, only, only replace the bandage every few days, not, not twice a day. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, okay. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna keep going here. Uh, stressors of honeybees, varroa mite, and if you want to see a varroa mite, I have one in this in this dish laying on top of this uh, uh, paper paper towel. So these are the the stressors, and you know the nutrition, the colony, and environment uh, all plays in the nutrition, temperature, rain, space, floor sources, and then timing for the colony development. So Varroa destructor, number one pest of honeybee colonies in the United States since they entered the United States in about 1987. Uh, they killed all, believe it or not, they killed all the feral colonies in the United States. They killed half of the beekeeper colonies in the United States. And we have been fighting that little tick like uh, pest ever since. So that's, uh, that's something that we we, uh, we, we just do. And there it is, Varroa destructor uh, mite. It, it vectors uh, viruses in, inside of a hive. There are something 19, 20 plus viruses 
in uh, that can get into a bee colony and it's not uh, the viruses take take a hive down if there's too many mites not you know so um, and there's larvae on top of that yellow uh, jar I have they get in the cells with the larvae and they feed on their fat bodies uh, which is con considered a liver uh, in humans um, <clears throat> there you can see the, the the mites on the side of that bee uh, poor bee um, if, if I was telling someone earlier if you had a if you had a tick on you comparable in size it would be like having a, the size a tick the size of your hand on your body now you can you know who would want that it's 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 bad I won't go this through this slide uh, but uh, another pest is that high beetle there that uh, that came in the United States the the mite uh, the mite came from Asia. This high beetle came from uh, in Africa. It's a hard shell little uh, little beetle. The the uh, bees can't kill it because if it's a hard exoskeleton. Uh, but there's ways that we control it. And there on the right, you see those traps. Uh, that's that's one of my colonies. But I, you know, some years we'll hardly have any of high beetles. The wax moth, the greater wax moth, will tear up a hive. But it's like it's like the cleanup crew. Uh, so a low colon, low population colony that's maybe dying anyway. The wax moths come in and and can be pretty destructive. Um, <laughs> amazing anatomy. Boy, I wish I had time to talk about that, but. Look at the antenna on the front head of a of a beehive. I mean, a, a honey bee. And then look at this next slide. You, uh, I'm gonna skip. Whoops, I somewhere I lost it. Huh. Okay, somewhere I, I lost a picture. It looks like, but uh, that that antenna. Uh, has seven different functions. With that antenna, uh, it it smells. It can it can it uh, senses gravity. It uh, senses temperature. It uh, senses the wind speed. It, it's 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 amazing. It's it's like a it's like a a weather computer attached to your head, literally. I mean, uh, it, when it flies, it, it knows it's, it's, you know, the speed at which it flies and, and, and the wind and all that, it, those, those are magnificent uh, parts. Uh, on the front, you have all the, you know, you have a gland, uh, see where it says mandibular. These are like the jaws, the front jaws of the, of a honeybee, and and uh, all, that's it's also a gland, mandibular gland. There's like I don't know, 15 different uh, glands that a honeybee has. Uh, there's 50 different chemicals inside a beehive connected with the bees themselves that the bees produce. Whether it's a queen, the workers, they all communicate somehow with chemicals. Uh, but the mandibular gland uh, in, a, in a queen produces what's called queen pheromone, for instance. And uh, when queens mate, uh, a virgin queen will leave the hive and fly a mile or so away to what we call DCAs, drone congregation areas. And these are drones from all around, but it's not the drones from their hives in the apiary because the drones only fly a half mile away. The queens fly over, you know, a mile or so, and they fly past. It's just uh, how how inbreeding is is kept to a minimal. You know, a queen will mate with 14 to 20 or more drones and maybe on a couple different flights or in the same flight, uh, but that gives great genetic diversity, uh, you know, that the queen needs. 
and that's what keeps the hive uh, thriving is that genetic, genetic uh, diversity. But anyway, the queen, uh, back to the queen pheromone that's, that comes from this mandibular gl gl gland, uh, you know, and those eyes, look at that. Uh, there's a big compound eyes. There's 550 uh, facets on each, each compound eyes on each side. And it's like this microscope of each facet, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I was way, I was way under 5,000 on each compound eye. Okay, drones have, yeah, drones have 10,000. Uh, why? Because they need to see those ladies when they're flying. Okay, <laughs> but, 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 but the, the queen, you know, has these, uh, uh, this this queen pheromone, this pheromone that she gives out. And did you know that a drone, uh, when a queen flies toward a congregation, that drone knows a queen is in the area within 60 meters of where he's at. Isn't that amazing? 60 meters away, a drone knows there's a queen there's a queen there, and the pheromone basically says, you know, drones, here I am, you know, <laughs> come get me or whatever. And uh, <clears throat> so compound eyes, there's also, if you notice ox oxalis, those are three little eyes up on top of the head, and they, they, uh, they allow light, pen uh, the light reflection and uh, sense, sense that. So a drone, uh, uh, Again, everything's everything's directional to the sun. Okay, uh, you know, boy, I wish I had time to talk about anatomy, but uh, you know, it's like the the foreleg up there. The, there's six legs. The front legs, if you can see that little crook in the elbow of one of the legs, uh, that is an antenna cleaner. So with the front front legs. They put their front legs and clean their antenna off, and that's isn't that super cool? Um, these four wings, it doesn't show it, but there's rows of hooks, little hooks, on the whole bottom edge of one of these wings, and when they take flight, they can hook those, they can couple those two wings together with those hooks, and that produces greater greater force of, of wings uh, to, to create speed. Uh, this is uh, the back leg has a pollen basket. They can carry a third to one fifth of their body weight in pollen, uh, in, you know, back to the hive. And there's a pollen brush, there's a press that they, they uh, this, this leg, they can press that together and press the pollen together. Uh, it, it's just amazing, amazing body. Um, of course, there's the there's a stainer that uh, everybody talks about, and the common question is, Bruce, have you ever got stunned? Yes, I I've gotten stunned before, but it, to, it, with me personally, it's like a little splinter. You know, it's uh, a actual splinter hurts worse for me than than a sting, and I work colonies without gloves on. Um, and I can work hives all day and not got, not get stunned once. Uh, so there's ways to, um, to do that. Okay. Uh, yeah, they communicate with taste, smell, touch, vibration, chemical, chemical. That's how they communicate, uh, by, by touching with their antennas and, uh, pheromones, uh, three different dances that they, that the scientists, they've all diagrammed these out, the actual dance, and they can interpret the dance. I've taken a test, uh, a ser series of tests, and they'll, they'll have a diagram of the test uh, on this test, and they'll, they'll, they'll tell you, or they'll ask you uh, where the bee is going in the direction to the sun based on this, based on this dance. Uh, diagram. <laughs> so uh, wagtail, tremble, round dance, three different dances. And here's the last slide, really. 
Um, so fortune B's average flight, uh, fortune trips may average 27 to two hours, average daily flights, 15 to 20 flights a day, average lifetime flight miles is 500 miles per B. And again, that's in three weeks because they don't start being a foraging bee till they're three weeks old and they die somewhere between six and seven weeks old. And, uh, and, and yet, each bee only accounts for one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey in a colony. And yet one colony can produce, you know, 80, 100, 150, 200 pounds of honey. Uh, you know, you, you do the math on how many bees that takes, <laughs> you know. In one year, yeah, in, in one year. Uh, <clears throat> so play this little video and this will wrap up. How is it, for instance, that a colony coordinates its workers' activity? What appears to be a random swarming mass of life may actually be intelligent behavior. A foraging honeybee will eventually discover a new food source, such as a freshly blooming flower or artificial feeder placed by a scientist. After this visit, an interesting thing happens. Over the next few minutes, many other bees arrive at the same location. They don't travel as a group. Instead, each bee finds the food source individually. How could these bees, who held no previous knowledge of this site, suddenly know precisely where the feeder was located? Is it possible that the animals communicate amongst themselves? To answer this question, Austrian biologist Karl von Frisch devised a series of experiments in the 1940s. Researchers at Georgia Tech have reproduced von Frisch's pioneering experiments using a modern observation hive. Two feeders are placed in different directions away from the hive. At each location, visiting honeybees are marked with a small spot of paint. A separate color of paint is used at each station. So, when a bee returns to the hive, it can easily be determined which feeding site it visited. Before von Frisch, other scientists had observed that returning bees tended to waggle about excitedly in a figure eight pattern before sharing the collected pollen and nectar with their hive mates. In this two station experiment, von Frisch noticed that the bees returning from the same feeding source danced differently from bees that arrived from the other location. While both sets of bees perform the classic figure eight dance, the orientation of the dances is offset between the two groups. Bees returning from one feeder perform a rotated version of the dance done by the other bees. Incredibly, the angle of rotation precisely matches the angle between the feeding stations and the hive. This must be a clue to the mystery of how the bees are able to share information about the location of food. Through further experimentation, details of the grammar of the honeybee's dance language began to emerge. The dance exploits two fundamental tools available to the honeybee. First, their ability to see ultraviolet and polarized light allows them to determine the location of the sun at all times. Ultraviolet light is able to penetrate thick clouds or fog. Also, as light from the sun passes through the atmosphere, it's polarized in a direction towards the sun when viewed from the earth. Devices like polarized film, sunglasses, or honeybee eyes can detect this orientation and determine the position of the sun even while looking in the opposite direction. This gives the bees a type of solar compass, allowing them to always know the precise position of the sun in the sky. A honeybee's entire environment seems to be constantly pointing towards the sun. In addition to this solar compass, bees possess a finely tuned internal clock. This clock is accurate enough for the bees to constantly estimate the new position of the sun as it travels across the sky. In this way, a honeybee can know the current orientation of the sun even after spending many hours within a dark hive. They can even take into account changes in seasons or latitudes. Inside of a dark vertically oriented beehive, 
The natural shared reference point is gravity, establishing both an up and a down direction. A bee's solar compass and internal clock provides another communal reference point, the sun. By pairing these two global constants, the bees form a simple language. Within the hive, the direction up, away from gravity, substitutes for the location of the sun. Then the angle that the bee dances compared to this up direction is the same angle a bee should fly away from the sun in order to find the target flower. So if the bee dances directly upward, other bees know that they can find flowers by flying directly towards the sun. If a bee dances 90 degrees to the left, then bees leaving the hive should fly 90 degrees to the left of the sun. A bee angling its dance towards the ground will let others know to fly directly away from the sun. As the day goes by, a bee will even use its internal clock to adjust for the movement of the sun in the sky. This lets fellow workers always know the correct direction to travel in order to find food. The central waggle section of the bee's dance also contains information about the distance to a food source. Longer time spent in this part of the dance means that the food is further away. Shorter durations mean that the food is closer by. In general, a bee increases the duration of this section by one second for every kilometer of distance to the food. When food is within several meters of the hive, this central section of the dance will shrink, causing a circular dance. For bees, distance is actually measured by the amount of energy it takes them to travel. Thus, a strong headwind could cause a bee to dance as if the food came from a further distance away. Again, the information contained in a honeybee's dance consists of two parts. One, the orientation of the dance which describes what angle to travel away from the sun, and two, the duration of the middle part of the dance which expresses the distance of a food source away from the hive. Other information such as quality or abundance of food might also be encoded within other parameters of the dance or in pheromones released by the bee. What do you think? Isn't that something else? <laughs> so, uh, all right, any, any further questions? All right. You've been great listeners. <laughs> Feel free to come up, look at some of these books, or um, be happy to interact with you for, further if you so desire. Excellent. Well, Bruce, <clears throat> that was rude. Uh, thank you so much. I found myself learning all kinds of things, and now I have the desire to turn in 90-degree um, directions and wiggle a lot to know which way I've got to go to get home. <laughs> but um, thank you so much, Bruce. That was Welcome. that was great. And thank you. Um, and you heard Faith say, I'm Jason. Um, I direct the Center for Agriculture and Food Security. And we met with Springfield Community Gardens 13 years ago to start this original part of relationship. And this is part of a multi-series, multi, um, multi um, number trainings. This was number one. A little bit of a, you know, work out the kinks, get to know us, get to know where we're headed, and a little bit of bee biology. And then May 9th, we will do another one. It'll be here again at Convoy.